You're listening to the Mashup Americans. Hi, this is Rebecca, and today we have a special episode. It was recorded live at the Green Space in New York City as part of our artist residency there, and it features the inimitable Min Jin Lee, author of Pachinko and Free Food for Millionaires, editor, and all around 10 out of 10 perfect Korean queen that she is. It was a beautiful, tender, open, thoughtful conversation, and I'm so happy to share it with you now. Hi, and I'm Rebecca Lair, and we're the Mashup Americans. Yay! Um, We are so excited to be here today as the artist in residence at the Green Space. We are so, so, so excited because there's nobody that we revere more than artists that we honor, that we want to aspire to be, that we aspire to be. And I think just the fact that we are here creating the story together with all of you tonight is just magic. Yeah, we're we're here. <laughs> we're here because being rooted in our traditions and looking to the future, examining what it means to be American today and creating what it means to be American today, that's our art. And in this moment where it's sometimes, sorry, it's very tender right now. Uh, it sometimes feels like our humanity is being tested. We could not be more grateful to be here with you all creating this story. So thank you. We cry a lot. Yeah, ugh, it's too we much. do a lot. I'm so sorry. We do a lot. I'm we were gonna like, make a joke about crying, but it's now, it we're actually happened. now just already doing it, it like, so it's it's here we, we are. We dissociated backstage. <laughs> We've been doing a lot of. It's like a huge journey we're on. Oh my god. Not even plant based medicine, just like us. No, but this we, is just mm. natural. <laughs> That's for another episode. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know. As I said, I'm incredibly tender right now in all the mashiest ways as as a Jew in the diaspora and as a mother and as a child of immigrants and as a human, I'm feeling a lot of ancestral grief kind of like at a cellular level <laughs> and pain and sorrow to for all of humanity. But I'm also in need of people and community and all of you. And so this is kind of the opposite of the internet for us and a lot of good healing. So I'm very happy to be here with you. I'm happy you're here too. Oh my God. It's really oh my good. God. Yeah. Oh my God. Really good. Oh my God. We're so here. anyways, I'll try not to cry again. Sorry about that. No, you can cry. <laughs> we'll cry. There's, uh, there's a lot of tears to be had, but you know, this is exactly also why we're here. Why we do this work is that I think what we have found is that what is like so healing and important and joyful and great for us, uh, we have been lucky enough to find out that it is healing and joyful and great for our people. And that is everybody that is in here. And so we're so happy that you're here. Oh, yeah. And, and this can, is, speaking of dreams come true. Why did you put your mic so close? I just all need everyone to know how close this dream is. <laughs> so oh our guest this evening is one of our heroines, author and queen of New York, Min Jin Lee. Uh, <laughs> She has not only written my favorite book of all time, other than Pride and Prejudice, she is a writer and former lawyer from Elmhurst, Queens, by way of Seoul, Korea. She's the author of the novels Free Food for Millionaires and Pachinko, a a finalist for the National Book Award and a New York Times bestseller. Min is the recipient of the 2022 Monhae Grand Prize for Literature from South Korea. She is the editor of the Best American Short Stories 2023, out next week. The first Korean American to do so. Uh Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and only the third Asian American to do so. And she is also um, our fashion hero. So with that, the stress of figuring out what to wear yeah. Next to Min Jin Lee. It like, was, you want to um, be surprised that we're all wearing jackets. No. Okay, just was, so there, there if you want to go. That there was, was a lot stuff. happening. You're going to see. Okay. Anyway, so let's welcome Min Jin Lee to the stage. Woo! All we're right. Here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm going to start crying, too. Sorry. (laughs) I did it. Sorry. I'm famous for crying. I'm always crying. Really? Constantly. And I actually did an event where (laughs) this doctor approached me and said, you know, you could take Paxil. 
<laughs> oh, excuse me. But he made it. He meant it in a nice way. But I mean, I, I read it. I mean, I heard it as criticism. <laughs> Rude. Yeah. Uh, I know he meant it in a nice way. I will welcome your tears any day. Also, of course, you heard it as criticism. <laughs> <laughs> You're what a model what minority. <laughs> That's how we hear everything. Wait, hang on. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> good evening, and also good evening, New York out there on Woo! Charleston Street. <laughs> um, well, so. Uh, Min, you have inspired us in literally countless ways. We're huge fans of your books, your writing, your style, your way of being in the world. And one of the things that you said to us recently that I think struck both of us, because it was such a clear definition of the way that you exist is that... um, Uh, Just to be clear, when you said it, I cried. Yes. Is that, uh, well, I think the question was, how do you deal with your rage? And you said, I am pleasant and difficult. And that was just like everything that we want to be able to be. We want to be pleasant, but we also want to make sure that we can make change that is often very difficult. So I just wanted you, could you share a little bit about what that means for you? Well, I think I'm always upset. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm from New York. <laughs> and and you're Korean. And I'm also, I'm awake. Oh, right. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. it. That's it. Right? I'm awake mm-hmm. and I'm alert. And I think that if you have any, if you're half awake and you're taking the subway, <laughs> you should be upset. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the world is so unfair. Mm-hmm. And people are so mean. Mm-hmm. And then there are also these moments of grace. So I keep thinking I can't change everything, but I can change a couple of things. And so I have to be difficult, especially as an older person. I'm 54, and I feel very responsible for my young people. Some of my young people are here tonight. And oh, hey. students, researchers, <laughs> people that I love. and People whose husbands are nervous to meet you. Right. Mm-hmm. Where, where is he? <laughs> <laughs> One of my former researchers got, got married, so we just embarrass her right now. But <laughs> anyway... Um, And I guess for me, I keep thinking I have to be difficult because I have to do the right thing. Mm. However, I want it to happen, so I have to be pleasant. Mm. And and I can be so fucking pleasant. Oh, (laughs) you're the most. (laughs) But okay. You also talked about a little, you know, the idea of like being hyper competent. Yeah. And how does that play in for you to being like the first and bringing people up with you? Well, I keep, well, because of the way patriarchy works because of the way Mm -hmm. white supremacy works because the way colonialism works it's such a fucking bummer it's such a fucking bummer if we don't do things perfectly so even though i am critical of this idea of being a model minority Mm -hmm. and i am Mm -hmm. i also notice that if we mess up we mess up for other people Mm -hmm. so i'm not interested in model minorityism for me Mm -hmm. i've already done that like i have a job i'm okay but I do notice that if I do something well, they will invite other Koreans. Mm. Right. They will allow other Asian Americans to do things. Mm. And, and I actually say things like, it wouldn't be terrible <laughs> if it's not just me this year, that you could have another Korean next year. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they look at me like, ah. Oh. <laughs> because well, sometimes we you we check that box. Right. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not enough mm-hmm. because I don't believe in tokenism. And I will say it in my difficult, but with a smile. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think one of the things that we admire so much about your work and that we always try and bring it to ours is this idea of being deeply rooted in our traditions and knowing ourselves and also using that to write a new future, right? We're not this, the stories that we have are not static. The culture that we live in is not static and that, that what we get to bring forward is something that we create. It's not something necessarily that has already existed. And so, you know, you have written so many different kinds of things, but when you're writing fiction, like what does fiction bring to you? Is the f- is writing fiction a way of telling a different kind of truth? Well, writing fiction is a way for me to imagine a new world. Mm. Mm. Like all I see is chaos around me. I see inequality, cruelty, and I'm trying to figure out, well, how do I make things better? Very few things can I control 100%. I can control what happens on my page. Mm. And I try very hard to create as much research as possible and then to create a narrative in which I'm envisioning a new world. If I'm just replicating what I see, that's photography Mm -hmm. in a way. 
and I'm not trying to put down photography. That's very hard to do. <laughs> but I'm not keeping a record. I'm actually keeping a record and I'm imagining a new future. And I do think that's important. The other thing that's really cool about writing, and I'm sure you guys have experienced this, is that you become a different person after you finish writing something. Mm. Uh-huh. So I'm always trying to tell my students, if you can learn something new about yourself in the process of this journey, then that's when you know you won. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because I think, you know, when we read Pachinko, we were like, oh, fuck, we wish that there was a Pachinko for like every single culture. Like yeah. that we could get. Or like, just history classes of which all, all kinds. Just have like, there was like, and this is where you actually read a beautiful history that takes you through mm-hmm. this entire period that's exquisitely written and very humane. Yes. And just that it was such a service to us and to anybody who picks up this book to read it. And is does it feel like a service to you? Like, do you write for your readers or do you write for yourself? I don't write for myself. Mm. Mm. People often say that. I've heard so many famous writers say, I wrote only for me. <laughs> and I think, well, that's a diary. <laughs> <laughs> I have probably lost a lot of friends right the second. <laughs> like, a lot of my friends who are writers have said this, and I always just think, well, that's interesting. Like, of course I wanted to write the things that I wanted to read, hmm. but I also would like you to read it. Right. Which means that I need to think about your pleasure and your tolerance and your clarity. And it, I always think of it like having dinner at my house. Like if you come to dinner at my house. I want to be invited. Okay. <laughs> Just a public uh, public peer pressure. Nothing better. Um, it's going to work, you guys. Like, I, will be, work. I will be <laughs> thinking about sparkling water and flat. I will be thinking about olives and chips. And I'll be thinking about dessert. Like I want to close strong. So yeah. I'll be thinking about dessert. <laughs> Absolutely. But I'm thinking about it because I'm thinking about your pleasure. Yes. Yeah. So not just nourishment, that's important, but it's also about your pleasure. And I want you to remember things. I want you to have emotional responses to that evening. That's just for dinner. So imagine what I'm thinking when I'm creating a book and I, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, you're giving me 20 hours of your life. I mean, if you buy a copy of one of my books, at this point, I think I make a dollar and 22 cents. That's it. Mm-hmm. I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think you made uh, $3.66 right that's there. That's exciting. Mm-hmm. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> but more than that, you have given me 20 hours of your life mm. and your attention. And I think that in the 21st century, to give somebody else 20 hours of your attention, that's an incredible thing. So yeah. I better make it worthwhile. Right. I do think that. And when I, when I read shitty books, I get so irritated. Do you finish them? Oh, I'm not going to name names because I bet you know her. <laughs> but I recently read a book and Amy's like, why don't you stop? And I was like, so I was so angry. Mm. For, you hate uh, read it. I, but then I felt that in order to officially say how much I hated it, I had to finish it. Right. Anyways, that's how I also felt about The Fountainhead. I was like, the, the, which we all know is a shitty book. So that's <laughs> different. But yes, I feel so angry about it. Why are you wasting my time? I know. Because they're bad writers. Yeah. Well, but then people say they're good. And I'm like, who are they? Why are they saying that? Okay, sorry. No, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> the that is the opposite of how I felt about your books, Thank which you. I stayed up all night, unfortunately, reading for Thank like you. a full week and didn't get any sleep and had to take my little children to school. But mm. it was a real journey. Ugh, the best, the absolute best book ever. Thank you. God. Yeah. You know, no. no I can leave right now. I'm trying to make you feel awkward now. Right now. <laughs> Thank you. So we have some, you know, Korean questions, mm. obviously. Right. Do you want to ask them? You know, I love to ask, okay, Korean, ask questions. Korean questions. Um, Rebecca is Korean. Well, you know what? I don't. <laughs> I am an award-winning Asian American podcaster. Podcaster. It's true. It's true. And uh, no, I have a certificate if you're my back. Yes, and I don't. <laughs> we'll never forget it. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we've been thinking a lot about what it means when you know something is cool that you that is you, your identity, and the sort of epic moment of. Koreanness, mm. 
How, that's you and me. That's you that's guys. A lot of people in here. Look at this. I don't Look at this room. You know, and you're you, you know you're going to see Eric Nam tonight, right? I am. Uh huh. Yeah. And recently, Stephen Yoon was at the Busan Film Festival, and he said the Korean wave is deeply healing. What has been your experience of that? Connecting into this like big pop culture moment of Koreanness globally. Well, it doesn't have to be healing. No, it's funny. Mm-hmm. Um, I like Stephen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Pleasant and difficult. And difficult. That was not really a flex. <laughs> no, I like Stephen. He's a really good actor. Uh-huh. And I don't know why he said it's healing for him, but I imagine that if you say something is healing for you, that means it was an injury, a source uh-huh. of injury, mm-hmm. right? So we have to look at not the outcome, but the source. Mm. So if you look at the source of the injury, that means that somebody did something to you. Mm. So when I meet Asians and Asian Americans who don't like what they are or who they are or have been made to feel uncomfortable, I always ask, well, who did this to you? Mm-hmm. What happened? And it's important. That said, for me, I think that in this moment of Hallyu cresting, I actually think it's going to keep going. Mm. One of the things that I have been doing for the past 30 years is talking about how complex it is to be Korean mm-hmm. and to not make generalizations about who Koreans are and what they represent and why they are popular now. I get this question all the time, actually, from Koreans from the peninsula. Mm-hmm. They always you know, put a microphone and go, why do they like us now? Yeah. <laughs> and I say, well, I don't really think of it that way mm. because they don't really know us mm. oh. because they have to know you and me and we're all different. Mm-hmm. And also I've interviewed so many, many Koreans around the world and I've heard very, very painful things. So most of the things that I hear are actually painful things. They're not pr- prideful things. Mm. So that makes me feel really sad. What well, makes you feel proud? I think our resilience in the light of so much oppression, Mm -hmm. so much difficulty. I think when I think about the miracle of the Han, which is this whole idea that Korea was an incredibly poor country and only in the past 40, 50 years that you've seen this rise where young people are thinking Samsung is cool, Mm -hmm. which is interesting. Um, I think what makes me feel really proud is the fact that even though things are really difficult, people are persisting. Mm. That fills me with pride. I always want to give more love to Korean people because I feel like they're not loved enough. I I really don't think they're loved enough. And uh, when I meet individuals, especially young people, I always kind of think, you're really remarkable. Why do you not feel this way? Mm -hmm. So that makes me feel really sad. So here you asked me what I was happy about, and I gave you the sad answer. It's very Korean of you, man. I know. It's so Korean. My God. (laughs) Well, you're also a New Yorker. I am. And I'm actually a very proud New Yorker. Yeah. How? Yes. How does how does New York shape? We've talked. I think we have an idea of like how your Koreanness has shaped you. How does your New Yorkness shape you in your writing? Well. I don't forget people who are in the corners of the room. Mm. Mm. I think when you're a New Yorker, you are always aware of how many people it takes to make this thing happen. Mm. You live in such proximity to so many people who are different than you in terms of every choice, religion, sexuality, socioeconomic class, neighborhood, regionalism, wishes. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, you can meet somebody who wants desperately to be a singer in New York and you can meet somebody who wants desperately to be an architect. Yeah. That in the same room, mm-hmm. the same subway train. And you can also meet people who are technically are supposed to hate each other, sitting next to each other, talking about, hey, where did you get those shoes? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I yeah. think that's what I love about New York. So you immigrated as a child from Seoul mm-hmm. to Queens. Mm-hmm. How in Queens, I feel like, is, you know, truly the mashiest. The mashiest place. The greatest on Earth. borough in New York. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Greatest. <laughs> we got a we got a <laughs> <laughs> Arsenio situation over there. Um, do you think that growing up in Queens in particular gave you that kind of diasporic experience or like a sense of of what it meant to have all these communities kind of working in concert? Well, when you're from Queens, you, you don't really think of race so much as country and ethnicity. Mm-hmm. So like you don't think yeah. of white people or black people. You think I was of, just going to say, we, do we have to think about white people? 
No, no, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing or a good thing. It's that you're thinking, oh, he's Irish or Italian and mm. she's Jamaican yes. or she's Haitian because that's who your neighbors are. Yes. And it's really nice. And if you meet somebody who's Jewish, you don't make these dumb statements because you're going, well, there's Ashkenazi, there's Sephardic. Right. There's first generation, there's fourth generation. And people have to, you can be conservative, you can be orthodox, you could be um, reformed. Right. And that just, like in second grade, you figure that out right. <laughs> in New York. And it's nice. It's yeah. nice because you're not going to be a jerk about it when other people are going through something. You're going like, oh, what, where is she coming from? Like, what is he thinking about? And that's very human. It's really not. Actually, it worked, it's worked out really well in my favor. <laughs> I don't think I realized what a gift it is mm. to have come from Queens until... I left Queens and I went to Yale mm -hmm. and New Haven and I met people and they were, um, how should I say this nicely? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. It doesn't have to be um, nice. They were so used to their own way of seeing things, mm -hmm. which was so simple. So you had all these really, really smart, attractive people mm -hmm. and they could be so simple. Yes. Mm. And that made me feel really Perfection. sad. And they thought they were right because they were actually in some way so much more fluent and, and cosmopolitan than I was. But then I thought, yeah, but you don't know how to take the subway. <laughs> <laughs> when you were in college, did you have that sense? I mean, uh, this is another thing about Korean swagger. Mm -hmm. Did you come in there and be like, mm, when you saw that, how long did it take you to sort of know, no, that's, that's only your way. That's not... Even because that was the dominant culture, let's say, of Yale. I think I had it because I am from Queens and because I'm not sure if it's the Korean part. I'm not sure. No, no. I'm just saying yeah, the no, sense no, I, of who yeah, you are. Who I am. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I was pushed around a lot at Yale. Mm. And, and the more you push me, the harder I get. Mm. So I really will not back down. Mm. Like, if I think you're unfair, I will not back down. Mm. If I think that if you're not nice, I will really not back down. Mm. Ugh, I love to bully a bully. <laughs> <laughs> so good at I it. I love a bully bullier, too. Like, this is... We're going to talk to Channing Nicholas about our astrology signs later, but, like, this feels very good. <laughs> well, you also have said that you were a super late bloomer. Yes. And yes. can you tell our audience a little bit about you know, what it was like growing up? Well, I was a late bloomer, not just professionally. I, I published my first book when I was 38 after starting to write it at 25. Mm -hmm. Took a long time. You're mm -hmm. doing okay. Yeah. You're doing, yeah, everybody here. You too might win a national book award. <laughs> <laughs> but I was also a late bloomer when it came to making friends. Mm. So... Even now, I'm a little confused. I think because I'm a little spectrum-y, I take people fairly literally when they say, I wish for this. Hmm. Like if Amy says, I wish to come to your house for dinner, I'm literally thinking, oh, must invite Amy to dinner. Wait. <laughs> this has like absolutely been our like, goal. So oh my God, it's happening! <laughs> literally, yes. Right, but then if she, if she didn't come, oh, I will come. She will come. I will but, be there. What but, should I bring? <laughs> But yes, you're, uh, but if yes. she didn't come, a part of me would just think like, oh, you misread that social cue. Oh, interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by, because I have met so if many. If I am not there, it means I am dead on the West Side Highway. It's like there's no <laughs> other reason. Oh, she abandoned of, her no, family. Speaking of dead on the West Side Highway, I had a dinner party with, where David Chang was coming from Momofuku, and he actually got into a car accident on the West Side Highway. Okay, so that was so, a bad joke. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, David. <laughs> sorry, he's, he's, man. he's absolutely fine. It was, it was absolutely fine. It but did I, happen. It, literally, like, he, he called, he's like, I was in a car accident <laughs> with three other people. That was terrifying. Oh, God. Oh, um, <laughs> but I don't like it when people aren't sincere. And actually in New York, I have met so many charismatic, really intoxicatingly seductive people. Mm -hmm. And they say things and you're going, really? Yeah. <laughs> Are you serious? Like, I don't know. Sometimes like, I kind of think, oh, I guess that's just the way of their being in the world. Mm. So I don't know. Hmm. They would do better to be more pleasant and difficult. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Here's a question. So we read that as a student, you hoarded syllabi from classes you weren't taking. Yes. And we've talked with several people that we admire about how their ability to be humble as students is what makes a great life. What What is being a student, what does it look like to maybe be a student for life? Like, how are you learning regularly? Well, Henry James says that you should be a person on whom nothing is lost. Mm -hmm. So be a person on whom nothing is lost which means that you are always paying attention. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really worry about Gen Z, the generation that I love the most, <laughs> is they are really worried. Mm. And they're really anxious because they have taken this idea and they're paying attention to everything. So a part of me thinks, yes, be an eternal student, but another part of me just goes, that's not important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna get better. Mm -hmm. And I really worry about that. And I mm. keep thinking, how can they when they have a fire hose of information yes. coming 24-7, mm. which never stops. I remember reading a newspaper on paper, yeah. mm -hmm. and I would read it and put it away and then walk on with my day. And there were decades in my life when I didn't even have time to read the newspaper. And now you can't escape it 24-7. So if you take this idea of being a person on whom nothing is lost, of being an eternal student, in some ways it can cause paralysis. Mm -hmm. So I really, really worry, and I try to figure out ways for kids to kind of go, you know what, can we just put down the phone? Hmm. Maybe it's reading books. Like for a couple of hours. Because I love you, please put down the phone. They could spend $1.22 right. and get one of these guys. You could get your brain back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Read some Dostoevsky. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the Russians are beyond me. Um, Crime of Punishment's really good. I do, I Anna Karenina that is so I, good. I was joking, though, that I was personally comparing Pachinko and Anna Karenina the other day, so never mind. But I was like, <laughs> I just you. did Anna Karenina, and I'd be like, oh, they're in the field again. And I just like, <laughs> I, I know what the, poly I understand what we're doing here. And I now didn't skip one word of Pachinko. So that's one critic's uh, comparison of Min Thank Jin you, Lee Rebecca. and Dostoevsky. <laughs> well, we have. We have the same birthday. Really? Mm. My birthday is the same as James Joyce, A Hundred Years to the Day, oh. which may be to why which I'm I so say weird. yes, 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 yes. That's what I'm saying. Somebody. <laughs> Somebody got that. You can't stop <laughs> us from being. If you know, you know. You know. Oh my God. <laughs> well, we have two more questions for you. One is it actually has to do with everything that we were talking about here today, and I think Rebecca's tenderness and what's happening in the world, and just like being able to understand today with what we understand from history. And the opening line of Pachinko is, history has failed us, but no matter. And what does that mean? Like, what can we take from that today? I think that resistance is powerful. Hmm. The willingness to love and to laugh and to remember and to extend grace, to persist, that is a revolution. Hmm. And the bad guys win when we despair. Despair is not enough. So for me, when I think about history as failing us, because for, let's think about the, what's going on in Azerbaijan right now with mm -hmm. the Armenians, mm -hmm. for example, we can consider what they're going through and historians are going to dispute the interpretation of what's going on. We can think about the Rohingya Muslims who are being expelled from their country and we can agree or disagree. However, these are individuals who no longer have a home. If you look at what's going on, um, the UNHCR will tell you that there are over, I think, 100 million displaced people right now in the world. Mm. So history is failing all of them. And how we're going to remember what's happening to them is one thing. But what they decide to do, how we get food and water to every single person, and I think the crisis of leadership has always been present. I think about that a lot. But I really am so inspired by resistance, the individual's willingness to be kind, to be loving, to be forgiving, hmm. a crazy word. Huh. Mm -hmm. Because we're not going to get anywhere unless we forgive each other. Some repentance and repair. Mm -hmm. And also truth-telling. Because mm. I think that's the insult of people who are asked to forgive, it's without the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think that when I think about um, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee and the work they did, it started out with truth, and then the reconciliation can occur. Yeah. What's your vision for Mashup America? 
You know, the simple answer, I want to say in the top note, is a kind of joyfulness about our complexity. There's so much joy in being mashed up. And I really wish that people would just recognize that the mashed up American is the American. Mm -hmm. Really. So just even that would bring me a sense of relief. Mm. Don't you think you'd feel a relief? Well, also oh, that maybe day. would have defined the literal future of America. So yes. yeah, right. <laughs> it feels good. But it's today. Yeah, it is yes. today. It's today. Yeah. We're here. We're here. We're resisting. And we're not going away. Oh, no. can't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> I am here. <laughs> well, um, okay. Um, well, we have to get you to a K-pop concert. Mm -hmm. I do. And, I, do. Um, I love Eric Nam. Oh, we, He's so I, I've been working on my heart fingers, but you know. Um, you no, the, the, this, is what I'm, this is what you're supposed to do. It's like, oh, wait, hang on. I brought you something. Oh. <laughs> You don't, you don't know that one? <laughs> That's like now the, I do. <laughs> um, well, we're just so grateful to you for Thank making you. this time and getting... Now Now you're, we'll never let you go. So. I know. We weren't supposed to stand and change the mics, but I got to. Thank yeah, you so we're going to say midget. thank you. Oh. Thank you. And tell Eric... I love you guys. Said, we love you. Well, that show was truly a balm for our souls. Min Jin Lee, our new best friend. We're so grateful for your brilliance and your light. What a gift to all of us. Everybody go buy every single one of her books. Each one is the best thing we've ever read. Thank you to The Green Space for making us the artists in residence this year. Being the artists in residence at The Green Space at WNYC and WQXR has been an absolute joy and honor. Next week on the show, we have the extremely hilarious Lisa Tregar, a Russian-American mashup who guides us on how to tap into our baddest self. Sometimes being bad is so, so good. So stay tuned to catch the rest of the ultimate guide to a mashup life. We'll have episodes every week, all fall, and like and follow the Mashup Americans wherever you get your podcasts. And tell your friends, love you. This podcast is a production of the Mashup Americans. It is executive produced by Amy S. Choi and Rebecca Lair. Senior editor and producer is Sarah Pellegrini. Production manager is Shelby Sandlin. Thanks to DJ Rob Swift for our theme song, Salsa Scratch. Additional engineering support by Pedro Rafael Rosado. Please make sure to follow and share this show with your friends. 